So great to see each of you here. Um, we do some things a little differently, not much, but some variations. Um, we are in the month of November. I can't believe it. You know, here we are. Wow. Uh, the elections yesterday, just a brief update and how we need to pray for our country. Uh, locally, if you're a Westminster resident, uh, Nancy McNally uh, did win the position of mayor really? by a march, a small margin, everything small. Uh, Nancy's a delightful person. We've had her in our church. I don't know how many times I've had her address our congregation as a, as a mayor before. Very conservative for politics. She loves our church. Loves her. Good lady. So pray for her. But I was very encouraged to see that uh, in our city, at least two of the three council seats that were open were taken by conservatives. One is a born again guy, David DeMont, who's been in our church as well, who's not too far from us. Nice guy, nice guy. Yeah, so we're we're encouraged locally. That was, those are some good ones for us. Um, because you, you want your city manager to be a good guy, has been an issue, but uh, city manager who kind of runs <laughs> the finances. And it, it usually it said, whoever controls the finances controls. So if it's your wife, she controls. If it's the city manager, he controls. If it's the treasure church, he controls. He, whoever, whoever. Um, nationwide, the victory for conservative Republicans, um, that's huge. That was a big with the governor uh, contest there in Virginia with uh, Glenn Young. That was big. That's really big. You know, we talk about these as a weather bell is the fancy word. These are bell bell weathers. <laughs> bell weathers. <laughs> Indicators of what might happen next year, the next election year. So if you're conservative, Christian will view that these are, that was a good victory. I, I believe um, the race is not concluded in Thursday, the Liberal Democrat winning. So that went back and forth. Hopefully it was the election of integrity, who knows anymore, but, um, but that was close, very, very, very close. <coughs> Historically, that isn't a close rate, so that was an interesting thing. Uh, we have a friend, Sean Scott, who won uh, Ward 3 in Aurora City Council position. So John Scott, this would be Esther Bond's brother, John O. John is a good guy, good soccer player, good family guy, just a good guy. So that's a, he won small margin, very progressively liberal ward. They say maybe we're small in Aurora. So we're going to win that. That's big. So is that a city council spot? Yeah. <clears throat> so that's incredible. And he's young, so he has a bright future in whatever he does. He's very talented, gifted. So uh, those are some neat things. Uh, I thought we'd just take a couple prayer requests as it relates to our country. And we'll pray for it. So a handful of prayer requests that you, you have on your heart for, for our country. Top three prayer requests. So what would they be? Top three concerns for America. <coughs> Where do you start? Where do you start? Life is always, you know, governments preserve life, protect life, defend life. So when government is complicit to complicit supportive endorsing permits abortion absolutely yeah. right. so that's always got to be very close to the top of the, the top when you pray for your country that's trying to so pray for our country we stop murdering people other prayer requests for our country that's too close to that, but it's, it's, it's close enough. Essentially, you, know, you think of Second Chronicles seven fourteen, and you know we can't even. This country is not in a situation where it can even humble itself and do what needs to be done. However, I believe that there are about thirty of the fifty states that can, that are the God fearing states, and twenty of them are basically, you know, Romans one situation and you know, do the example in history of the divided kingdom okay. right and so you know they lasted another 
What was it, 150 years? Yeah, 722 to 586 for the last the methods, yeah. Yeah, so it's an interesting thought. It's one of the things that, you know, comes up quite a bit in my conversations is that um, the states begin to kind of take back their sovereignty and regardless of what the federal government says, says we don't care about a Supreme Court decision. We are not having infants killed in our state. We are not having, you know, all these other just horrible Romans one type things mandate to us. We, we are digging in. Yeah, that's good for our states, where government's configured in the constitutional republic, the yeah, state rights, including in Texas, for instance, where Governor Abbott saying if the federal government isn't going to do their job, then we'll assume our role and defend the border or whatever. So uh, how will that be received by federal government? Probably not well, it hasn't been. And it could be. Well, the marijuana thing seems to be going well for states and not caring what the federal government says. Yeah. That's only, it only works one way. It's a rat that it only goes in one direction. Yeah, right. Right. So when, when they get a court decision they don't like, they ignore it. When we get one we don't, don't like, we obey it. When, when we lose, we, we go home. When they lose, they go to the next court. Yeah, very true. Okay, so prefer a country to prevent, repent of abortion. Pray that the states that has still a bent, maybe some numbers towards good righteousness, the nation that, you know, the country that exalts righteousness shall be blessed by God. So it's prefer a country, prefer states. Okay. Maybe one more prayer request for our country, what would you say? Well, drilling down into the local level, you know, you mentioned the mayor level, that even those elections at city levels, you know, Colorado passed the law here while we were sleeping in the summer that removed removed the ability for a city to have um, undue, unjust civil laws against gun owners. So now the city can implement whatever wild and crazy notion they want against rightful gun owners creating villains and, and criminals out of gun owners at the city level. So you might be driving 50 feet from one city to another, violating laws in a city who had no idea that they had created these monstrous laws. And that was over to that was done by uh, Polis in the summer, which I gives the cities way too much power. To, to generate that kind of leak, that kind of law. Okay. Good. Yeah. So, okay, let's pay for our, our rights to defend, bear arms. Okay. Uh, let's kind of a related topic. Uh, next week, we have um, Veterans Day on Thursday, and we don't always draw attention to our bulletins, but these are available in the lobby when you come in. And we do list those who are related to our military. And um, maybe John Alfelkis can share a couple of his, his, his vision for military outreach in a moment. But I'll just share the list with you. So Justin Connable, you have the Connable family uh, in our church and all those Connable boys. You have Justin, who's a Marine, works on helicopters, works on Air Force <coughs> One's helicopters. So he's regularly very much near the president. Uh, Daniel D. This is our Hispanic pastor's son-in-law, so Pastor Hendricks has a daughter, Margaret. And this is um, Daniel D. Um, is her, her husband, Christopher Dino. Dino. I'm not familiar with that last name. Does anyone know that connection? And, and the way these prayer requests for people to call in from the church family or visiting and. Share, would you pray for so and so is related, maybe a nephew or whatever? So it could be someone a little more removed. Uh, one of our deacons, Felipe Garcia, one of our Hispanic deacons, his son Nico's in the Marines. <coughs> you have a Matt Gottschall in the Naval Aviation Services. And I'm not sure about Matt Gottschall. Is anyone doing that? Then we have our pastor, Skip Hunter. He should be back tomorrow after a week of vacation. Um, his son, Ben Hunter, is in the Army. He's a Ranger. Uh, he went to the Citadel in South Carolina, a prominent military school. school. And uh, he's whatever rank he's in, he's an officer. Then Ethan um, flies. He went to the Air Force Academy, and so did his wife. So both he and his wife are AFA grads, and they both are pilots. 
imply some unique stuff. And often Skip has no idea where they are. They're not really sure. Uh, Carson jumps. This would be Bill jumps. Uh, son. He is um, an army chaplain. He also went through the Ranger program, so he he understands Ranger. That's a very that's a step above <laughs> the training. Uh, you have the Rismas. Both of these are Air Force Academies. Ken's been, Ken and Susie, it was neat. Both Ken and Susie are Air Force parents. Susie outranks Ken. So you don't, probably don't want to rub that in, but Susie was a major. <laughs> Ken was one under. You're not suggesting. I would never suggest that. <laughs> if it comes up, I see no evil. <laughs> so Chris and Nick Risma, both Air Force Academy grads, you know, still they're owned by the government for a while. If you get that degree, I think it's a six-year commitment or more. Uh, Lauren Sides, I don't know her. There's three here I don't know. Ezra Truman, this is Sean and Janice's son. He's in the Navy. Mike Wise, and there's four I don't know. Mike, I don't know. anyone know Mike? Then Matthew A. Yates is Jeannie Yates' son, a grandson. Grandson. So Matthew Yates, Army. Uh, any other uh, prayer requests regarding the military? So next Thursday, my son's doing a barbecue at his uh, company in Wellington at Western Hardwoods. If you are interested, if you're military related, I know you'd be pleased to have you. Just I need to know a little bit, some numbers for them. So he was planning to do a certain dinner and he was meeting with his financial consultant and was sharing how the company's monies are used, actually how his personal monies are used for military stuff. And the guy says, man, I love what you're doing. Uh, what's the next event? He said, next Thursday. And the guy said, just tell me the bill. I'd like to pay for that dinner for everyone. <laughs> so, so Jim's looking at, he thinks he'll do it, but you know, you never know. He's never done it before. So but I pray for that outreach on Thursdays up there on Thursday next week. Pray for our veterans. Several of you have served. Thank you for your service. Let's pray for our military kid, our young people here. Anyone else to add on the military? Your son Benjamin in the National Guard. All right. Pray for Benjamin, National Guard. Kentucky. That's right, National Guard. One, one of the bowling boys is I think it's Michael. Micah. Micah Bowler. Yeah, Micah Bowler went in the military. I forget which Navy. branch. Navy. Navy. He's in the intelligence community. Yeah, he's a sharp kid. He was I think life changing in a good way for him so far. All right. Anyone else to pray for? So when we break up tonight, we want to pray for our, our government, the first level we talked about, and then we want to pray for me. Maybe we can get in groups of three, pick pick a couple of these guys and pray for them. Pray for their families. Okay. Um we we then have um the Sunday coming up with Ben Peterson coming. Uh, Ben's passion is uh, working with young men, uh, training them in, in life, for life, and then also wrestling. <laughs> he was a gold medalist in 1972. Um, I've not met him. He's a friend of Paul Trigg's dad. Paul's used him for years. Ben's coached for, I think, 30-some years at Maranatha Baptist College in wrestling. So uh, he was coming in to do a youth uh, wrestling clinic. I was having lunch with Paul and he said, I'll talk to him, and maybe he's open to speak. So he's coming in on Sunday, so that would really be special. Did, have any, did any of you watch, like, Ben Wrestle in 1972? So he has, he's a Wisconsin farm boy. He's the youngest, I think. They're just, they're just farm strong. There's a difference between farm strong and gym strong. You don't, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. There's, there's two different strengths. The guys on the farm... They're just always working. There's just a farm strength. They're just strong. They're just, they're just strong. Then you got guys who they, they couldn't tell you, you know, where milk came, comes from, but they'll get into the gym and they'll pump iron. And they're they're powerful too, but it seems to be a different type of strength. So the Peterson boys um, grew up working the farm. 
And in 1972, Ben wrestles and goes all the way through and through and wins it. And the way he wins, did any of you see his victory, how he did it? He was behind. And out of nowhere, just absolutely lifts the guy up out of nowhere. I mean, just, there's no way. You look at the move. You have the, Google Ben Peterson 1972 gold medal. You're not going to believe what he did with just like 10, 15 seconds left to get a two-point reversal to win the thing. So is it freestyle or Greco-Roman? Greco-Roman. Oh, Greco-Roman. Greco so you need to see it. You need to see it. His brother loses to the Russian in his weight class. So his brother loses. Dan Gable, who was my hero growing up, Dan Gable, their buddies. And Dan, Dan only loses once in his whole lifetime. And when he lost that last that match in, in high school or college, I forget what all, he said, I will never lose again. And uh, the word was sent out throughout Russia that Russia would pay an enormous amount of money for anyone who would train and beat Dan Gable. And Gable would, uh, his training was very focused and intense. He would take a set of cards, 52 cards, and flip the card over, let's say it was a 10, he'd go down to 10 push-ups. Mm -hmm. If it's an ace, 20 push-ups. If it's a three, three push-ups, and he'd just go for the whole deck. Just, <laughs> just, just a beast, you know. And um, just total attack mode. Well, in 1976, Ben and his brother John, they go to wrestle, and, and Ben gets beat by the same Russian that beat his brother in 72. So they have a common denominator. Ben and his brother both lose the same guy. One in 72, one in 76. And you should see that Russian. He is a beast, an absolute beast. So some really great stories. But uh, more importantly, Ben has had a, you know, an international impact of the gospel as a result of his you know, international competition. So really look forward to it. We want to pray for that for this Sunday. Um, probably for time's sake, and for memory's sake, maybe we should pray for these things we just mentioned right now by just maybe a couple of us praying, and then um, we'll hit our lesson, and then I'll share some of the prayer requests with you here. So, um, Bob, I'm going to have you start and have you pray for our country, uh, to repent of our abortion, pray for those 30 states, pray for our city level here, and praise God for our some, some victories. Uh, let's pray there, and then Sam, would you mind praying for a couple of our peer, your peers or your age? Um, on that list. So I'm going to have you pray for just maybe three or four of those names. And then, Troy, if you pick it up from there, that would be great. Let's just pray, and then we'll get started. Um, John, before we start, John Alphalantis, if you could share what is your biggest burden for the military that we can pray. I'll close that. I'll pray on that one. Uh, we're going to do another honors burial. Uh, these will be abandoned but identified veterans. I think we've got 10 this time. And so pray for that because it's a good way to present the gospel. Um, that'll bring our abandoned veterans up to about 130, I think. But Can you explain to the men what that actually involved, what, what this is about? It's an unbelievable story. Well, a number of years ago, the VVA, the Vietnam Veterans of America, learned of veterans on a shelf that were abandoned but identified. And a lot of them were just sitting in crypts. So we started with Crown Hill and a number of other ones, Olinger. And I think our first veterans uh, honor, uh, honor burial was 30. Uh, and basically it's just giving uh, to these guys. Uh, some of them were from World War I and World War II, Korea and Vietnam. But we give them full military honors. And uh, that's something I think they really deserve. Uh, the, the, uh, I'm not thinking a lot really good right now, Pastor, but I'll, I'll just say this. The model of the Vietnam Veterans of America, <coughs> never again will one generation of veterans abandon another. And in doing the honors burial, we're able to honor veterans from all wars. And, uh, Another concern is uh, we're going to be doing our our poppy giveaway to four or five different King Superstores uh, just before Veterans Day, and that's a good way to raise a lot of good money that we can pass on the veterans. But I'm a little concerned about the the uh, the virus, 
that God would protect the guys that's going to be there. But those are my two big burdens right now, Pastor. Thank you, John, for sharing, and thank you for your part in both of those. And those honorable burials are just amazing what you guys have done over the years. So thank you. Okay, why don't we pray, Bob, and then Sam, and then we'll try to close, then we'll get to our lesson. Okay. Dear Lord, we just come to you in the spirit of thanksgiving because of the positive results from yesterday. But we understand that we've got a, a long way to go. And, and uh, Lord, really the, the the heartfelt need of this country is we need to turn back to you. This is a country that has a tremendous amount of blood on its hands because of this abortion situation. And this goes all the way back to 1973, Lord. We just, we know that this is multiple millions and millions of children. Um, more in it, you can't get any more it's it. And, uh, and this Holocaust is a distinctly American Holocaust. And we understand that this is several times worse than anything that occurred in World War II uh, in terms of the, just the bureaucratic slaughter of little children. And Lord, we just ask you if it, if it requires judgment to get this country to turn our hearts to you and to understand that you will not be mocked in this area and that there is such a thing as judgment and that you have withheld judgment. If that's what it takes to bring this country back into alignment or whatever part of this country can be brought back into alignment. <clears throat> We hate to be in a position where we're asking for judgment, but that might be what's necessary. We'll leave that to you, Lord. But we we expect your judgment because of this horrible, horrible sin. And moving into the area of the states, where the states have the ability legally to not let this sin continue in their states. And we just ask you to give them the intestinal fortitude, uh, looking at you. Uh, to be courageous and say, we are not going to allow these terrible things to occur in state after state after state after state. And Lord, if that can forbear a judgment, at least in those places, that is a, that is a worthy prayer. But Lord, we, uh, we just ask that uh, we, we get an education in sovereignty. We get an education in that the federal government only has so much sovereignty that it's on loan from the states, that the states have residual sovereignty and they have the ability to stand in, in, in between and interpose between that which is unjust and evil and that which is right and pure. And the ultimate sovereign authority is you. And that is another area that I ask for particular guidance with our elected officials. Because in this country, as elected government, we do not have the same understanding of sovereignty that people, for instance, who live in a monarchy. And we don't have that concept that we need, that you are the ultimate sovereign. And Lord, we just ask for this education and for the courage. We ask, frankly, for men to be men where they need to be and to step out and lead and to fulfill their responsibility as leaders and as defenders, specifically as defenders of these children, not just children of the womb, but children going into schools and protect them from these vile things that are being taught and inculcated in these schools. And Lord, we, we know that it's going to take men to be able to step forward and prevent these things from happening. Hopefully yesterday is the beginning of that and that's 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 among our prayers mm -hmm. lastly for my prayers we take it to the local level where we understand that the, the the government that's closest to the people is where most of the governing should be done and it's an opportunity for us to get to know personally local elected officials to pray for them to hold them up to be there when 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 they need us to give them the support, prayerful and otherwise, so that they can do the right thing and that that connection not be severed, and that connection be, be vigorous and alive. 
And Lord, it's hard to do so sometimes, but we pray for even those elected officials that we don't agree with, that we are very much opposed to. And our prayer for them is always first with mercy. We always ask for mercy for these for these people, specifically our president, our governor, and a lot of people who we don't believe see your way. And we know the need there, among many others, is salvation first. And that is our prayer for all of these officials, that so they are there in positions of authority by divine appointment. And we understand that, and we submit to that to the extent that we can, and that you would have us to do. And Lord, we just lift up these officials at every level, at the federal level, the state level, and the local level. And we just ask that your will be done in these areas and that we learn once again how to function like the country that we were when we were at our best. Whatever that was, that is our goal. And I know that that would look like something that where you have a nation that's close to you that puts you first. That is my prayer this evening. Amen. Jesus' name. Lord, I'd like to lift up the men and women that have gone into service, uh, specifically from this church, the Rizma boys, and Micah, and Justin, and all the others on this list, that as they have entered into the service of our country, that they would remember that they are ultimately in the service of you, and that they would be strong testimonies and lamps in the places of impact that you put them, that as... Um, um, my brother just prayed earlier that they would just be strong men and women and be good testimonies. Uh, we also pray for their families and parents, especially that you would just ease any worries that they might have and that whatever happens, that they know that you're in control and we know that all things work together for those that love you. So thankful for all the things you've done. So. As we continue, we... <clears throat> We do pray for Jim and this ministry that he has with Marines. Lord, thank you so much for the testimony that he's been able to intervene at crucial moments where these these men and women were um, facing decisions that they felt were um, beyond their control. They uh, had only one way out. Thank you that Jim was able to step in and help them see the light, save their life physically. And Lord, that they would give him an opportunity and others to um, spread the light of the gospel that it might save their life from an eternal standpoint. So I thank you for his ministry. Thank you for his heart, for his fellow suffering Marines, especially in this branch. Uh, Lord, the, the trauma, the things that they've um, endured and seen and dealt with and handled and bear uh, in their minds, I pray that you would um, assuage those memories and um, Give them calmness and uh, I pray that this this outreach would be a, a time when <clears throat> when Jim and others would have a, a, a strong impact. Lord, I pray for my cousin Chandler um, and his desire also to serve in a similar capacity um, of uh, counseling with uh, ex-military. I pray that you'd um, give him an opportunity to meet up with Jim, uh, that they might be able to partner and, and share ideas and be an encouragement one to another. So we, uh, we thank you for those folks that have served. Thank you for John Alpeltis, Lord, and um, even as he's uh, going through his own battles here with cancer um, from Agent Orange, that uh, you would give him strength <clears throat> as he's doing battle on the physical front. And Lord, also as he's uh, encouraging and bridging that gap to a generation of soldiers, uh, Lord, that is needing um, care and attention. So I pray for this ministry uh, with King Supers, that uh, you'd protect the folks that are there participating and um, uh, that give them uh, just protection to this season. And we also thank you for the, the honored burials and the, the credit where credit is due. Thank you for the service of these men and women or that um, were apparently abandoned. Thank you for John's ministry and uh, bringing them uh, an honorable burial and that, Lord, that there might be uh, folks within uh, John's earshot of the gospel that would, would hear the truth of your word and that uh, the seeds would be planted or there may even be a great harvest. And so we uh, pray for John's ministry as well. Thank you for um, these uh, two reports locally of uh, John O'Scott um, uh, receiving 
<clears throat> the number of votes needed to win Aurora. Thank you for Nancy and Nally here in Westminster. Uh, Lord, uh, a friend of the church, a friend of you. And uh, we pray that they would uh, stand strong in these positions. We know that the enemy uh, would, would choose to find any, any area at all to destroy their credibility and uh, discourage them. So I pray that you'll uh, be protecting them with a special edge of protection as they move into these new areas of service and that you give them uh, insight and wisdom as we uh, we see in <clears throat> we see even in Proverbs that we shouldn't lean into our own understanding, Lord, but seek the understanding that comes from you and your word. Thank you for our Bible study tonight. <clears throat> we look forward to continued study um, as time allows in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for our time together tonight, and we thank you for this country. And has already been prayed, very rich heritage, and yet uh, we have been on a slippery slope with choices that uh, offend you. And we we think of the horrible loss of lives, uh, the innocence and the innocent ones, and then the just the slower death of a nation through false teaching through humanism, through just a denial of your word and a rejection of the gospel. So Lord, I pray that we would uh, seek your face and that we would see some revival in seeing you do things for those who are seeking you and that you bless. We uh, thank for Nancy McNally and her husband. We pray for them as they back into office here soon. Um, give them help, and they're, they're older now than, than they were before when they served as mayor. As she served as mayor, give her a sermon, give her grace. We pray for uh, Tim Carlson, the chief of police, who recently just resigned. And Lord, we we wonder if he should have waited for this election because uh, things are will be different with her at the helm. But uh, we pray for Tim, for his family, protect his testimonies. Had such a desire to be a good Christian witness in the police force. Andrew. Thank you for our friendship. We just pray for him. Uh, we pray for Pastor Larry and his ministry as chaplain. We know that uh, with the wrong mayor, that would have probably terminated this round. So we thank you for preserving uh, someone in that key position that would want the program to continue. So we're thankful for that. We pray for John O, a young man, may have a bold and healthy career and make a difference in Aurora and our state. And then, Lord, for John Alfaltis and his ministry for the Vietnamese over the years, and for soldiers from that era, and for those who did not have an honorable burial, neglected, overlooked, thank you for the ones that they've done, the ones that they'll be doing soon, that this would have a very meaningful testimony and message to those that will attend. Lord, thank you for our time together tonight. Bless down this study. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor. Yes, sir. I um, wanted to report a praise. Um, wanted to report a praise. Uh, we had some pure work done by our home office now. I've taken a lot of our text. We came up to Lakewood. Yeah. Okay. Texas Springs. The guy's name is Daniel. was the computer guy. He had a two-hour conversation about the home Amen. I'm, kind of, I'm sure I messed a few things up, but I got the general idea. Of <laughs> Good job, John. Yeah, I got him to say that uh, to, to pray to receive you. Amen. That's, what's his name again? Daniel. I don't never did find his last name. But Daniel's Lord, fine. The Lord knows his last name. <laughs> Amen. That's awesome. Yeah. Good job. Keep it up. Just kind of, it just kind of came naturally. I know the Lord was doing it because it just fell in. Absolutely. Fell That's really wonderful, John. Well done. Well done. And Aaron, Aaron Rodgers has COVID, so uh, he won't be playing this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John, for that update. A little bit of humor there. Yeah. I'm trying to break it up. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> good, 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 good. good, good. Thanks. Well, we are in the sixth chapter. We should finish it up next week, Lord willing. But I uh, thought I'd just begin reading at verse one. And I do have a handout that I was planning to give you. I was just going to do the study. A little more technically for the whole sixth chapter. So uh, I have this these numbers with this for you the next week off the end. Just gonna let the print went down. Um, but I'd like to read up to verse 15 and then 15, 16, 17, 18 is where we're gonna camp out tonight. But uh let's let's begin. What shall we say then? First one, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And uh, notice tonight when we do get to verse 15, what then? 
Shall we sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace, God forbid. So you're seeing a very natural break in the passage. So it's being repeated. That usually means there's a question that's going to be argued or defended or explained. And then we have a second question very similar. And then it's going to be explained. So, uh, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is, de is free from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall, be, shall also live with it. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto, uh, unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin, because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, and that you, ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. We're going to talk about freedom tonight. It will be our theme. Um, we have a, a friend, Jim Bird, who will be with us, Lord willing, in March. Jim has um, written a number of excellent books on sanctification, and wisdom, quieting, and lazy soul. A number of really, really good words. And uh, he'll be part of our, our counseling conference in March with uh, Kevin Bird from uh, Georgia, Jim's from South Carolina, and then our own Ed Bolkley from here. And uh, the topics be freedom. Freedom, freedom from addictions, life dominating sins. You know, Jim's put together um, a ministry called Freedom That Lasts. So, really great things freedom, but that um, continues, freedom that lasts. So, we're really praying, like you join now with us, so that we would have a really wonderful conference for our church and for other pastors and people of our age. And as a result, we will want to do a better job discipling people who do not have freedom, people who maybe have professed Christ, but they have some life dominating sin. And uh, what could be an example of a life dominating sin where man is just seems to have a grip on someone? What could that be? I mean, obviously, almost an infinite list, but what would you say comes to your mind on life dominating sins? Sins are just control. Alcoholism? Alcoholism? Okay. I was going to say cowardly dependency. Drugs, 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 and alcohol, drugs, pain, drugs. Anger. Sure. Anger, unrighteous anger, or righteous anger not dealt with properly, that turned unrighteous. Okay, so anger issues. Pornography. Pornography. Pride in your own accomplishments. Yes, thank you. Pride. Look at me. Look what I've done. I could be a life dominating son. Anything else come to your mind? So if 10, 21 year olds came to your office and they said, uh, I'm getting married, I'd like to, uh, you know, I'd like for you to counsel my fiance and I, and we're gonna get married in six months. How many of those 10 do you think are having problems with pornography? How many have had problems with pornography in the past of the 10, just what was you guess? They, if you ask me, have you ever had any problem with pornography in the past? How many of those 10 would say, yes, I have? What was you guess? All 11 of the 10? There might be one who doesn't, like eight or nine. Okay, eight or nine. Okay. First of all, pastors, they wouldn't need to counsel me. They have to counsel me. 
pronounce it. Okay, so that's counseling. instead of pride. Okay, so sure, pride. sure. <laughs> so both are going to need some help. So let's say, let's say it's eight. You know, thank the Lord there's a few Daniels out there that have purpose in their heart that they're not going to defile themselves with anything. They've, they've chosen and have enjoyed victory as a teenager or a young man. So let's say eight out of ten. So let's say that's a close percentage. What would be your strategy, at least when you meet a young couple and a young man seeking for premarital counseling to get the marriage off on a good, good foundation? What would be your strategy? I want to look around first to find out if they've received Jesus as Lord. And okay. Savior. So definitely find out their spiritual status. Okay. And everything kind of shoots. All right. Shoot Foundational. Somewhere. Absolutely. Good. Excellent. In terms to like combating a pool toward pornography, like I feed their like all their search histories to the other person. That way, like they're accountable to each other. So anytime they would go somewhere, it would show up on the other person's like history log. Okay. So, so there are there are but, techniques um, in, the, in the world of technology to safeguard and build in accountability and more eyes. Okay. So you might want to talk through a strategy of. of Purity from this day forward, okay? Some things that could help. So, um, if the guy had a big pornography problem, does he share that with his fiance, or is maybe just put that on first? I don't know. How do you handle that one? You, you start counseling the guy's transparent and says, Yeah, I'm, I had a real problem. But I'm going to get married, that's going to solve my problem. Marriage, marriage is going to solve my, my pornography problem. I'd refer him to you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. All right. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so how would you determine, is this something I should share with his fiance? Yeah. Um, a young men's study that I've been attending, okay. um, we actually brought that up as like a discussion topic. And one of the speaker's main points was, like, you will never love another human being more than God. So if your relationship with God isn't very good, like, what makes you think? you're going to be able to stop for another person. So it's basically like, you can't, that's impossible. Think no argument, that. greater to lesser. Yeah. Okay, okay, very strong argument. All right. So what did your group say about telling the fiance that you have a current problem? Um, <laughs> some of the more like public school minded kids are just like, you know, it just depends on the girl. Like some of them are okay with it. So they're like, that's the easy workaround. But most of them were just kind of like, <laughs> you have to deal with it. Like, but they they didn't really have a good answer. Most of them couldn't figure out like how to just like pump the brakes because it's a it's a very like internal struggle, as like with most addictions. And so you like want to overcome it on your own strength. So there's like the self pride that's like, well, I could just take care of this. Like, I won't tell anyone. You know, I just got to keep got committing, it. I, I got to dedicate, and like, maybe, but that's like the statistical analogy, right? Usually, you, like, that's the way God works. You have to be humble with other people and ask for help. Okay. So. Do, do you think a wife can be helpful in this area as accountability? Um, after you're married? I mean, now nah, you probably still need marital counseling, like, yes, <laughs> but... But I, I would I would personally lean to her no, but I'm not married, so <laughs> no, no, no. I think you're giving great, great thought to this. Thank you, Sam. So what do you do? They come to you, you're in a position to, of influence and maybe this is performing the wedding in the case of a pastor, and they always come and they want to put their best foot forward and you actually talk on things of this nature, and you find out that he's had history and still has problems. So what are some of the questions you want to ask about the current practices of that young man? What would be some of the questions? And then let's follow up with how far do we go with that fiance being aware of this struggle? I'm going to find out if he's involved at that moment, I mean, at, you know, currently. Okay. In front of what their, kind of what their Bible reading and prayer life is together. Okay. That's existed. Okay. Any other, any other, we can buy well, in the scenarios, is, are we assuming both people are saved? Yes, good, good question. Both are she saved, he's saved, both make professions of faith. I think the first question I'll ask is why does he think it's okay to emotionally or spiritually cheat on his future wife with 
the internet and there are girls on the internet why that's acceptable to him yeah okay great question okay anything else you'd want to ask him so you're assuming we already know they have a pornography problem he's on he's he's admitted it this is a case study where he's you've asked okay. have you had a history of pornography <laughs> yes and you probe a little bit further what what does that history look like what what Tell me a little bit more about that history. And currently, how's how are you doing? Well, I'm not doing so well. I mean, you know, I have some victory here, and then I fall back into my habits and whatever. But I'm going to get married, and she's so beautiful. I won't ever have this problem again. Okay. So when when is it the time to tell the the fiance, the girl, or later they're married, the wife? Is there do, is that something you can do? What What's your thoughts on that? I think she should know, but we're talking about it being a guy, but a woman can have trouble with pornography too, can't she? The stats are going sky high with women. Yeah. They used to be low. It's 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 one of the yeah. fastest growing stats. So I think the stats is a female pornography problem. I think you've got to get it out on the table between both of them. Okay. I'm pretty direct person anyway. So. Okay. So who else would agree with that or disagree with that and why? I'd agree with it, but it would have to be under the right circumstances. I mean, you have to disclose that with support for the other individual, whether it's the guy with the problem or the gal with the problem. There has to be somebody to support both both people and help both people deal with the hurt or the damage that's done. Yeah, that's an excellent point. This is when you're counseling, sometimes you're helping the individual struggling with it, but you never address the person who's been hurt by it. And that person needs some, some you know, often needs encouragement and help too to work through it. That's a very good point. Often, often overlooked. At what point do you, you want to have a degree of mercy as a counselor? I mean, mm -hmm. sure, but at what point do you draw the line of mercy and all you're doing is enabling? Giving the guy a free pass or making him feel that way, or the woman, and get down on this thing. I mean, I don't know. I'm not using the right words, but I think you know. No, what I mean. no, it's it's a real it's a tough one. As a counselor, sometimes you'll reach a situation where you, in your spirit, you're saying, "Yeah, I, 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 this is not a good situation. I don't think they should even get married until there's a victory." That is a really tough spot. And it's it, that's where you've got to just really seek the Lord. And I've had to do that with certain situations where I've said, "Look, I just you, know, you can go for get married. That's your you know you're, you're going to do what you're going to do." But I, I just I don't feel good about this. I feel like there's a real problem here that's not been corrected. And I think you're going to take it into your marriage. And I think it's going to wreak havoc. And, uh, and, and especially if the lady doesn't even know the issues. You know, I've I've I've, had, I've been part of one wedding before I was saved. With slow Joe as his best man, he was marrying a beautiful girl, a school sweetheart, and uh, she was pregnant. No one knew she was pregnant when they got married. No one knew she was except me. And you know, he he, he kind of helped me help me on that one. I, I should have said something to us. I should have told him you need to talk to the parents. You need to this is this is you need to have some full disclosure on this dude. But I I, I agreed to keep it a secret. And um, shame on me, shame on me. That's embarrassing. Okay, and then uh, I had a very dear friend in seminary that I was uh, asked to be his best man. I knew he had severe problems. I knew he had severe problems. And it was just starting to come out before the marriage. And um, I think the pastor asked me a little bit, and I kind of hedged. I was young, young Christian, no excuse. But uh, I should have said more. And uh, that couple still married, miraculously still married. But that, that poor girl got blindsided. I mean, blown out of the water. I mean, and I could have helped. So I felt really bad on those two accounts. Yeah, Troy. There's not really one phrase answer to this question. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've been struggling with my one word answer. <laughs> How do I answer this in one word? So I'm, I'm reading back to our, our verses. <clears throat> well, no, no, you not. You know, or should we should we sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace, God forbid. So, you know, is this young man or this young woman, are they realizing that this is sin? Maybe they don't think it's sin. Okay, well, we've got to 
understand what category this falls into. Is it sin or isn't it? If it is, should we just keep sinning because we're under the under grace? Well, God says here, God forbid, and whoever we yield ourselves servants to to obey, that's to whom we're a slave. No. So, if this um, prerogative, if you were, that's what we're talking about, it's a sin of the mind, primarily, but also a sin of the flesh. Would a um, would a pastor or a deacon or someone in the laity, would they be uh, brought before the church in a Matthew 18 scenario if they were physically engaged in this kind of activity? And this is a mental activity, we're saying, or a uh, line of sight, I say. But to look on a woman is the same as being a adult with her. So it's a pretty serious issue. Okay. Um, so I'd want to probably put some more, more words into it along those veins okay. as far as the category that the Lord sees it in. Um, it would disqualify a pastor from being a, a leader of the church. It's a very serious business. So entering into a marriage, you could almost see or characterize it as a device that would unravel a marriage. Yeah. So if you're about to unravel a marriage before you, you form the marriage before the start, what what are you doing here? Yeah. You know? So anyway, those are a few more words to than just a little bit. Okay, so let's let's hit on the passage here. Um, verse 17. There's one word in there I'd like to just draw a start with. So but God be thanked that you are the servants or slaves of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart. So when we talk about any of these life dominating issues, the issue is the heart. Out of the issues of, of, of the heart. You know, out of the heart come issues of life. So it's keep your heart with all diligence because what proceeds comes from the heart. Jesus talks about it's not what comes into you that defiles you, it's what comes out of your heart that defiles you. So the heart's the problem. And in this passage, you have um, the word doulos used multiple times. Um, you, you have two words that are often used in, in Greek for, for a slave. Uh, one is the under rower. Kind of the the Ben is it Ben Hur who was you know, a slave in the gal the galley slave you know, you know ramming speed you know that's that's a, that's the under rower under rower slave slave this is more the house slave that's you're <laughs> doing all kinds of meaningful meaning you know things around the house so the doulos in verse sixteen it talks about you know yielding yourselves as slaves unto obedient slaves a douloi you know to whom you are slaves. So one, two, three. Wow, wow. Three times at least do loss is used in the passage slave. And then uh, there's a distinction made in the passage that you're either a slave to this one uh, situation sin, or you're over here a slave uh, under obedience and righteousness. So you, someone is your master is the point. Okay. And the hearts involved, you're giving your heart to a master. So you're either giving your heart to sin and disobedience and Satan and his team and scoring points for the wrong team. You ever scored a basket for the wrong team? That's so embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then the, the other slave is slave in the righteousness, the Lord's team, you know. So it's someone's the master, and we're just servants either way. Either way, we're still servants. So who you know serve? Serve sin or serve obedience, serve Satan or serve, you know, savior. Yeah. You know. <coughs> As I as I listen to this, I think that a lot of men, a lot of men have had problems with this. Yeah. Pastors, youth pastors, music guys, everybody. Um, you know, I'm just wondering, we can sit here in judgment of the other guy, and we've been guilty of it ourselves. Um, I think this is also should be a discipleship situation where if a person has that problem, the counselor does, just doesn't point out, well, you've got a problem, but come alongside, come alongside and, and, mm -hmm. and, and disciple them and, and help them along in this area. Um, Absolutely. You know, I, I just don't know if there's enough of that. Happening. No, I'd say that the whole purpose, obviously, of this class dynamic change for men and hopefully tools that you can help personally yourself, trust as you trust God in helping others. That's exactly what this is all about. 
and what I'm trying to even tonight share with you is let's say eight out of 10 guys have had history of pornography, whether currently engaged or in the past, that just emphasize the need of alongside ship ministry, discipleship, accountability, working through this type of passage. This chapter six is exactly what we all need. Because it got, like I got a call yesterday. You, you, you're not going to know the situation. It's not within our church. Call very early. You know, um, I usually don't answer my phone that early. And, and I, if I, if I, if I don't see your, if I don't have a name on it, I usually don't answer it anyway. I let them leave a message. I'll call back. But I said, this is an unusual call. And so the call in essence is, I need to make a confession. So you're a priest. <laughs> well, in this part, it, he, the person had offended me. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, oh, had, they okay. had sinned, so they were, there's multiple people involved. Um, but the, the topic was he had been giving the air of being a spiritual person. But in reality, he was being dominated by a sin. He was a slave to it. And it just about destroyed his marriage. And he was crying out for help and accountability and forgiveness. Yeah. And the word it was repeated was freedom. He says, um, I, I'm so thankful. I, I feel like for the first time since I was 13 years of age, long, long, long time ago, first time I feel like I have freedom. Yeah, with, with God, I have confessed. And, and uh, with my wife, I've confessed. And I'm just, there's several things I've, done in the process that also affected you and and uh, others and and he's just getting clean it was freedom it was just freedom okay so with, with forgiveness the power of forgiveness but there was also in that conversation looking for help and come back with kevin saying there's not enough help out there yeah. you know we, we we're critical of others when maybe off we have the same issues um we we do not help people the way we should and uh, you know, Paul says, "Take heed lest you fall." You better take heed, buddy. You know, when you hear someone else struggling with, you can do the same thing apart from grace. So, so this freedom theme. Let's walk through the freedom theme here, because there's a passage. There's a couple things here that relate to whatever the dominating. And we, we've been picking on one. It's, it's such a problem in our in our culture today. So let's begin verse 15. I'm just going to give you a very stilted translation. You don't have my sheet in front of you, but I'll just give you a, a very careful exegesis. So what then, or what therefore, shall we sin, that's future tense, shall we in the future sin, yeah, whether that's five seconds from now or five days from now, shall we sin because we are not under law, but strong contrast, and contrast of being under law, not being under law, we're under grace. So that's a whole, that's a big theological topic. Um, the main purpose for the law, what was the main design for the law? Point out and sin, point our way back to Jesus. Okay, so law definitely was uh, used by God as a schoolmaster to point us to Christ. And what that process looks like, it it, it brings us under conviction. Let's get we're law breaking, we're sinners. Okay. So now that we're saved, um, we're not going to throw away the moral law of God. <laughs> um, that's for sure. But we're we're under under certainly grace, and because we're not under some, let's say, legal obligations, um, we're not going to sin more. Just like, you know, he argues in chapter 6, verse 1, you know, just because of, um, we have, I'll read the word. What shall we say then? Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, no. We've been saved by grace and we're going to, by the grace of God, try not to sin. And now that we're saved here in chapter 6, verse 15, God forbid, we're not going to want to sin more because we are, we're not under, under this law, all of it. Um, no, uh, we're under this grace principle. So let it not be. And um, it's really beautiful here. I think King James says, God forbid. But uh, the, the verb system there at the end of verse 15, let it not be. What are some of your other translations? By no means. Miss, what's that? By no means. By no means, okay. God forbid. It, what's neat about the verb that's used there, let it not be, 
um, it's an optative mood. Hmm, I haven't even mentioned the optative mood. So we've talked about the you know, subjunctive mode, the indicative mode, and we've talked about whatever, whatever. This is called the optative. I like you know, the simplified. The optative mode is the, is the mode of hope, is hope. So there's just the, the verb that, that Paul uses here is saying there's such tremendous hope. We don't have to sin. And have to be dominated by sin. I mean, if we stumble in and have an advocate with the Father, we, we, there's forgiveness. But we don't have to live in where sin dominates us. And uh, let it not be that sin dominates. We have hope. It doesn't have to work be that way. And this directs a conversation with men. Some guys have been in bondage for so long, they don't think there's any hope. They've tried. <laughs> I mean, they've tried over and over and over again to break whatever that habit is. And they've gone back to the bottle. They've gone back to the, the girl down the street. They've gone back to whatever, whatever. And what we, we need to encourage people, there's hope in the Lord for victory. There really is. He can give it to us. And um, I'm an example of it. Many of you are examples of it. Praise God for that. So then he says, verse 16, uh, have you not known, uh, so the question is being asked, there's a question, haven't you known that to whom you yield yourselves or present yourselves slaves on obedience, uh, you are slaves to whom you're obeying, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. So all of a sudden, what we have here is we have that same verb that's being used again throughout <clears throat> throughout the book of Romans is this word yield. We saw it already. I, I talked about it last week. Here it is shows up again and it's talking about yielding or presenting or offering yourself. So you've got to view yourself, okay. I can either offer my attitudes and actions, thoughts, and actions, and offer them to sin and, and, and the devil. Or I can offer these members of my body, my being, unto God. So there's an offering in view here. There's a decision in view here. And for Christians to really get victory, they got to realize that, that these bodies are, are, are significant. <laughs> they can either serve sin or they can serve righteousness. Choice. A choice. So if I'm reading this right then, what, one of the cures is to start serving righteousness get involved in, in church um get involved in ministry um i mean is, is that right or, or are they disqualified from doing that well i think this you're going to serve someone <laughs> and uh, so yeah so there may be limitations on your service depending on your issues um but that's not a trick of the devil where the devil says if you don't clean it all up you know you're not worthy of doing anything you know, so, again, trying to knock the legs of hope out of you. That you know, why even try to serve? You're, you're a loser. You have a sin problem. You got blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. So, it's, if I'm working with someone, I'm saying, look, your 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 focus is on your flesh, yourself, your sin, and it's dominating you, and you're continually offering yourself to sin, and you need to make a conscientious choice to die to sin, and you need to present yourselves alive unto God. As a living sacrifice, we're going to use those same members, but for righteousness. And that, that is dealing with moral righteousness as well as acts of righteousness. So there's got to be some service involved. So, you 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 know, you know we just had a mulching project. I appreciate whoever helped with that mulch. And then the time before, we were doing the mulch a few weeks ago on that big work that we had. Um, well, you might have a problem with some other sin. Probably going to do mulch, right? Mm -hmm. You're probably going to be this or that. I might not be preaching in the pulpit on Sunday uh, initially, but yeah, service is critical because you, you've got it, your mind conditioned into serving yourself and what your flesh is. Your flesh is hearing voices. Okay, that's the verb that's used here. Let's look at it next, where it says, um, Have you known to whom you present yourself slaves on obedience to whom you are? Obeying whoever you're listening to uh, is the idea there is hufukuate, whoever you're listening to, and you yield to it, that's your master. So if sin is you know crying out to you and you're listening to that temptation, it's temptation is not sin, it's when you yield to it. 
when you yield your members to it, now now sin has been conceived. And of course, for that conception, death is, is, is imminent. So Pastor, I, this could be something other than pornography or sex. It could be other types of things. A million things. Yeah. yeah. It could be. And, and each of us, you know, Satan doesn't try to customize his temptations to what yeah. our aptitudes, propensities to sin is. He, he's learned us. So he's really trying to trip us up. But um, so it's that listening word is obeying the King James, obeying is the same word you could translate listening as well. Hearing, hearing. Acoustics is the verb. Akua. Acoustics. So you're listening to sin and you choose it. Sin is your master. If you choose to do right and serve, a, you know, a righteous, right, do right, then righteousness and God is your master. So it helps us to realize you are a servant on either side of the equation, and on each side you have a master. So who do you want? Who, who do you want your daddy to be? Who do you want your master to be? And we got to say, you know, I'm going to die to my old master. That guy's dead. And that body was crucified on the cross of Jesus. That guy is so dead. I don't want, I'm not going to choose anymore. I'm going to reckon and I count myself dead to that. And I'm going to present myself to God. Okay. And that is a marriage tense. There's a once and for all presentation of I'm going to surrender all to you, yield all to you, offer my total being to you. And hopefully the state of that carries me through life. And maybe the need of daily dying to self. We've talked about that. So there's a presentation. And I think there needs to be more preaching on this. Have you offered yourself to God as righteousness? Have you presented yourself to God in righteousness? We're talking about to Christians. That's a Christian message. You know, uh, the world's the world's calling for an offering. The world's calling every day. Offer yourself to this website. Offer yourself to this service. Offer yourself to this store and this booze. Offer yourself. Yield yourself. Come in my door. It's all day long. And we got to say, you know what? I'm going to say no to all those doors. I'm dead to that, and I'm alive to God, and I'm going to make this choice. And Lord, I'm offering myself. So it does involve service. Pastor, I think there's something empower, empowering to Christians if they can see what you just said. Well, I think Paul's trying to get us to that. And um, I'll just share here that last part where I find a lot of hope. Um, he, he says this in verse 17, but grace to God that you were slaves of sin, but you've obeyed or you've listened out of your heart or from your heart, that which was given, uh, that which was uh, that form of doctrine or that example of teaching or that type of instruction which was delivered to you. So uh, you, it's something really neat in the first, the first 17. You have um, obedience addresses the will. It's a choice. Obedience is a choice. The heart addresses the heart, the emotions, you know, your, your center. And then doctrine addresses what part of our makeup? Knowledge. Our knowledge, our head. So the passage here is really powerful. You've obeyed. You made a choice of your will. Out of your heart, you engage your heart, the emotions. Uh, your head's been involved with doctrine, teaching. So the total, you know, when, when, when Paul says present your body as a living sacrifice, he's saying you're all, your total being, your total being. Okay. But you have obeyed, uh, but out of your heart. And what, what does God want? What does God need? He needs nothing. But what does he want? He wants our heart. And as a parent, I'm saying to my son, my son, give me your heart. Give me your heart, son. And that's one of the key things in parenting. You want your kids' hearts, that they trust you and they love you and they're not holding back their heart. Out of that, you know, son, son, give me your heart. I love you. I have your best, best interest. Interest, follow me. So you've obeyed uh, out of your heart that which was that that form of doctrine, that example. The word there is tupon or typos is the is the noun. So the type of uh, didoxic, you know, didoxic, didoxic teachings, instruction. So you you you've been taught something. So so when it comes to our failure in discipleship, there's three things here. One, we're not teaching it. We're not, not teaching discipleship. We're not talking God's way for sanctification and victory. So there's a lack of instruction. What are some of the ways that Christians will tell you they have is sanctification works for them, that the world has told them? What, what, what can you anticipate when it comes to the topic of change to hear from a, a young Christian or an immature Christian? What, what are some common little slogans that they'll say? 
So like the pick you up by your own bootstraps kind of thing? Okay, that's a, that's a good one. How's that working for you? Pick up of your own bootstraps. Okay. Now I'm going to participate with God. I can make some choices. Maybe I can be a little stronger. Be strong. I can be stronger. Okay. Is it the uh, don't judge me routine? You know? <laughs> it could be that. It could be that. It must not be saved. All right. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'll the Calvinist. Yeah. Okay. You're not saved because if you're really saved, you wouldn't have any problems. You'd be coasting by now. What are some other ways we say, you know, we, we say about the fig tree? What are some really dumb things you hear people say? Like non-committal, like I'm working on it, or like little by little, where you can like tell it's not actually anything moving forward. It's just like that's an excuse that they're telling themselves. Okay, I'm working on it. Okay, and that that can be good if you're working with God on it. I'm, I'm trusting the Lord to help me in this. I'm working, you know, cooperating with God. That's great. But if I have, I got this. I'll figure it out loud. And I can do it on my own. The, the one I'm thinking of is lifestyle. If you have a lifestyle that's, that you think is all right, culture thinks all right, and the person says, well, well God made me that way. Yeah, okay, now we got a big problem. Yeah. But, uh, so the I medical we model, when we get to that freedom that lasts, the world has for alcoholism, that's a that's a disease model. So I was thinking more if, you, gay if you're a drunk, well, gay too. Yeah. So if you have, if you're a drunk, it's a disease, and that's discouraging. You can't overcome that. I mean, what drug would you yeah. use? There's not no hope. But if it's a sin, if it's drunkenness and it's a sin, then there's hope. Here's if, a common if, one. Yeah. Nobody's perfect. Yeah, that's a bow out. No, you know, I think that's, <laughs> no one's perfect. Any other things you might hear? There's a bunch of them. Start listening. So we're not teaching is the point. We're not teaching biblically how to change. We're not doing it. Um, the heart. How important is the heart? You it's know, huge. It's everything. Yeah. It's everything to God. You know, we're to love God of our whole heart. Everything about our heart. Our emotions. We may, you know, God, God, we're made in his image. So where does... Um... The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Come in. Yeah, I, I think that's true as well. So there's all of us have such depravity that there's parts of us so wicked. I, I don't even know how wicked I really am. I mean, there's some elements of that for sure. When I was a, a singles pastor, it was amazing as I talked to, to these singles and there'd be an excuse that everybody would come up with an excuse. And, and one of the things I try to teach them, and I still try to teach this is that's why we come to church. And so, well, I can't come on Sunday night because I got to do my laundry or whatever their excuses are. And they, they, they are, they're missing the whole re I mean, it's a blessing to come to church. It's a, it's a blessing for me to sit down and, and find out what the Bible says about this, and, and maybe I can change my mind about it. And so I, if I don't know it, but in, I mean, personal devotions and stuff, too. Uh, this all enters in um, as we're trying to train these, uh, train everybody, I, I, myself and others. Is, um, but we can't, we, we can't know this. Unless we're reading passages like this. Mm -hmm. yeah, the other one is that when I start talking to somebody about Jesus or God, then they say, well, that's religion. That just sends the hair up on the back of my neck. That's kind of a stupid oxymoronic statement. Okay. Yes. okay. I don't know all that means. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, Jesus no. was never about religion, but they all want to put yeah. him in that category. Yeah. That's why it's oxymoronic. So I, I see here the will being engaged, the heart being engaged, the mind being engaged, total person, all three aspects are very much needed in the in sanctification. We need to be teaching. There is some knowledge. It's got to get to our heart. We've got to make choices. It's a very, very powerful passage. And then it says, here's our freedom, verse 18. Uh, being set free. Being set free. When you obey from your heart the doctrine you've been taught from the Bible and you make those right choices, you're set free. So, and, and it's a passive voice. God sets you free. You know, he's working with you. And God sets you free from the sin um, that, that became, you became enslaved. 
uh, for the sin, and you became enslaved to the righteousness. Wow. So I, I like that addiction. Uh, I like that men Paul talks about we're addicted to ministry. I want to, I want to be addicted to the righteousness. <laughs> okay. At the end of the day, I want to be addicted to that. <laughs> And, and, and it can't get off that addiction. No, I want to run that addiction really the rest of my life. So just in summary, you know, all of us are slaves. That's not going to ever change in this life. It, 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 what changes is who's your master. Are you going to let sin be your master, righteousness be your master? And when we trust the Lord, obey his word from our heart, then we're set free. Then the freedom comes. And uh, he wants us to be addicted to righteousness. So it's a very, very, very powerful passage. And I'll just follow up on the accountability parts. So how can we come alongside someone? What are some of those accountable points? To some, whatever the topic is they're struggling in. Or that life-dominating sin that they offer themselves to and that's mastering them. What are a couple of the accountability things we should do to help them overcome? What are some techniques, methodologies? <coughs> I suppose call and check in on them. <laughs> okay. Okay. That goes along with come alongside. So, how often would you call, John? I know there's no pat, pat answer for everything. It depends on how, how involved the person is, how it's clear to them. But I would guess at least once a week, but maybe you have to call them daily for a while. Okay. Good answer. So, we have some conversations that go on and texting that goes on to some people every day. I'm picking up some things that I need to. Yeah. So, but I don't need anybody to call me, but you know, I just get it here. So, okay, so help here. So, it could be a, a text, it could be a call. Yeah. What else? Some one on one time to encourage the brother. Yeah, sure, and just as, no, no substitute for being being together. And yeah, let's get together. How are we doing? How are you doing in this area? It takes too much time. <laughs> I would take them. I would take them to one of both field. That would be really good, John. Get the minds off and in the right place. Yeah. So, um, so the thing that's just me. So the communication, the time, okay, very important. And that's hard for all this time is challenging. Okay. What else would you do? Certainly pray for them. Absolutely. You know, I, so I pray for them and pray with them. I'm just reminded of my my brother when when he he was led to the, I led him to the Lord and I took him to a church before I left and I talked to the fellows in the hallway and I said said hey listen uh, he just got saved I can't disciple him Can you, would you guys commit to finding someone in the church. It would take some time to, 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 to be with my brother and, and bring him along. And, and one fellow said, you don't have to worry about it, I'll do it. And it was the business director of the church. And for the next year and a half, that guy spent an hour with my, to hour and a half every single Monday with my brother. And now my brother's on staff at that church. Wow, that's a great story. So I'm telling you, what are we here for? You know? Yeah. That's too much time. That's too much work. I think we get sometimes psyched out because we don't have time, or we think we're not really successful unless we're you know, doing this with 50 to 100 or 500 of these guys. But if we each had just you know, one life touching one life oh. like that, yeah. You know, Tremendous multiplication takes place in time because quality investment of time in, in getting them to serve and mentoring them into, into a new master in relationship. Yeah, good, good. All that takes time and needed. And then just one last follow to that, you're helping that guy, let's say, Rich bought up something extremely significant. What about the wife who has felt so betrayed and is so lonely and is now fighting bitterness yeah. and now he's getting all the attention and help and no one even thought of me and struggling okay so when you have a wife who's been offended hurt betrayed a lady needs to come alongside her yeah. and have some bible study and encouragement yeah. and get healing yeah. get some healing so there's not bitterness in that home <clears throat> some victory with both of them um, 
can move forward. So very, very powerful. Okay. Um, I think we'll close here just for time's sake. I had a, something I think we'll do next week uh, on, on a prayer topic. I think it'll be really helpful. I think this is this this chapter six. We'll finish it early next week, and we'll try to come back and really beat in the key points. We'll just come back. I know we're cycling through it multiple times for repetition and purposes. When you read that, when you hear those words tonight, you're saying, "What in the world is he saying?" Even though we studied it, don't you still say, "I'm not sure what he's saying." I, got, I mean, really, don't you feel still at a little lost when you read it? And how many times have we read Romans, some of us? 50 times, 100 times? I, I have to really slow down and put the words together. To yeah, my heart, it is. My heart and mind, to think my heart and mind together to get the full appreciation. It is mind. really tough. It is really six tough. Six and seven. So Romans six and seven. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're a rich order. This is where we want to be. I think Peter puts it much better in chapter four on Missouri now with the okay. teens. Okay. And it's like, oh, this this comes across so much more clear, but it's the same sure. concept. Sure. You remember the passage you had in mind? Um, it was first Peter chapter four, one through nineteen. Okay. Um, was the one that I mean I've been doing it with the teen uh, teens and uh, doing accountability with pastor nathan and we we talk about once every other week he calls and we pray and discuss and discuss issues and stuff but um yeah i was amazed i was like oh this this sounds just like romans chapter six except in a little bit plainer english <laughs> well, it, it's peter who, who yeah. writes about paul what does he say at the end of his epistle and paul wrote things that were Difficult to understand where men rent them to their own destruction. Destruction. <laughs> I get it. Paul's tough. I, I, I've got to read through this, and I've, I've studied it, you know, word by word, phrase by phrase. I'm still saying, say what? What are you saying again? <laughs> so we got to keep coming back. At least I do. And these stacks, these stacks of commentaries to give you another idea. Oh, I got plenty of those. Yeah, same problem. What in the world is he saying? Yeah, I need to get it. I need to get it. But pretty soon you start realizing there's two themes. Reckon, account, reckon dead, and present yield alive. So something negative dead, something positive alive. And that's the two watersheds are going, everything's flowing into two points here. Count yourself dead, offer yourself alive unto God. You have the union with his resurrection, you're in union with power and life. So is it stop doing this and start doing that? Yeah, put off, put on it, you could say. <laughs> Yeah. Really? What are you doing in the church? Are you doing anything over here? Let's hey, come listen to some Bible verses with some kids. Okay. You know that kind of stuff. Well, I, I, I think Kevin, for a while, Kevin. Oh, I think God <laughs> uses guys like Kevin who confronts you right to your face. How many would like Kevin as your accountability partner? Anyone like my Kevin? Pass. <laughs> <laughs> I need a Kevin personally. Depends upon you need Kevin, he'll confront you to your face and behind your back. And then he'll, oh, tell, you, then he'll tell you he did no, it behind your back. No, no. <laughs> Depends how he did it. He was mean about it. You know what I said the other day about you to song so <laughs> I, I know as a as I've coached enough, there's you know, kids need Kevin. two types of coaches. And I can still see, you know, Dick went to almost every one of our kids' games where Coach Peterson and Wade Whiteley, uh, the assistant coach. They knew how to get in the kids' faces and kick him in the britches, get a little better performance. And I, my wife was mortified when Coach Peterson, you know, grabs a face mask at Ben and pulls him head to head and Ben's our quarterback. And he got in Ben's face, and I mean, just bellowed in, that, in Ben's face, you know, just close to what he needs to do. And I'll tell you what, Ben said, yes, sir, and he corrected us. <laughs> okay. Hmm. For me, I like, oh, they're please do this for us. I just want to encourage you along. <laughs> and some players need that encouraging. And some need that kick in the britches. Some need both. Yeah, probably all of us need those elements. So, so, so you're saying no to Kevin as your partner? Definitely. <laughs> I think he's going to be your partner. I think you need him more than ever. Are you we'll saying you're a wimp? I'll, I'll let him handle my financial uh, <laughs> <laughs> refinance. <laughs> <but> <laughs> <laughs> Kevin's the best at that. Okay, I'll close this in prayer tonight. <laughs> Lord, thank you for our time here together. Thank you for this passage. Uh, Lord, we are just slaves. 
And Lord, before yes. we were saved, we know what we were slave to and to whom. Uh, we were a slave of Satan, and he was a nasty slave master, a horrible pharaoh. And uh, we're so thankful for deliverance and for our exodus through Christ and uh, the miracle and the power that was shown in, in, in transferring us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, your beloved son. And Lord, now that we're in the right on the right team, the right kingdom, and we present ourselves as an offering unto you that we would yield our members to you and uh, be your slave, be your servant, and may our lives be seen as a life filled with righteous living and choices and thoughts. Mm -hmm. And may we have the right master and may we may have the right offering. Lord, you know the battles we all face. Every man here faces certain battles. And I just pray that we as a group here would, would stick together. We would pray for one another, that we would be strong, and that the men of this church really would be the, the type of men that uh, this world needs and the church needs. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen, guys. Great to have you.